Praise God. Thank you, ladies, so much. If you have your Bible, please turn with me in the book of God to 1 Samuel chapter 17 this morning. 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Appreciate how that song ministered to us. And thank God we can know with all our heart that His blood has paid our ransom. We give God great glory. Remember those who are out of town, vacation season is upon us. And I appreciate the fact that uh, people make time and they're able to with their family. I believe one of the greatest things you have is your family. And uh, but we've talked about this before, how that before God ever started a church, before ever God called a preacher, God raised up a family. God instructed the home. And so take time with your family and spend time with your family. And uh, one of these days when you're old and decrepit and, and there's no one else to come see you, that family's going to be all you got. Yeah. And so you invest in your family now because one day you're going to need that in your life. And so um, that's one thing the Lord's really been helping me see. And a lot of older pastors have told me mistakes they've made down through the years. And they said, if there's one thing we can always go back and redo, they said the number one regret, some great men, some of the greatest men in the ministry, they said, is we didn't spend enough time with our family. And uh, you can make a God of your family, but uh, I really don't think that's, uh, that's happening a whole lot in ministry and, and in churches. I feel like they've been neglected and forsaken. And uh, if you've got a husband or wife, you ought to, to invest in them. And so love on them and uh, be there for them. And, and if you've got children, man, you, you've only got a couple of years. Last night, my wife's with her family. I'll go down later to meet her and her family, but the house is awful quiet. And I... You know, I, I thought last night, for the first time before I had Beckham, it didn't bother me really to stay in the house by myself, but now that, you know, Beckham's gone too, I thought, man, it's just, it's really quiet. And uh, it, it hit me last night, I'm like, you know what, I about, I about had to press spell for a little while, about 1.32 o'clock this morning when I got home after preaching in Eden, I thought, one of these days my house is going to be quiet all over again. You know, that little boy that I love so much with all my heart. You know, all these memories, I love them now. I can't imagine 18 years of this with them. And, and then he's moved out, and my house is quiet again. I mean, it just, it, it tore me out of frame. So you've only got, Brother Ralph Sexton says, you've really only got about 18 summers with your children. 18 summers are all you got. And the uh, problem with America is there's been a breakdown in our homes and our family units, and, our, and um, we, we need to get back to investing and, so you remember all those who are on the road and out of town. And, uh, boy, I feel, feel the Lord today. Thank God for his presence. And, uh, man, it's going to be a, a sobering message this morning. Not a shout out, but it's a sobering message. And I know we always try and challenge the graduates, and so this message really goes at the heart of our graduates this morning. But it, it really extends beyond that to the heart of all of us, every one of us in this room. You know, can be spoken to by this, this message. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, look with me and please in verse number 20. And uh, that's where we're going to pick up our reading. And before we do that, let's ask God's blessing on the word that we're about to read. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to open up the book of God today and to read the scripture. Thank God that we can know what thus saith the Lord. And we can know what you have to say. And we can stand on that word. And God, we thank you that we can have confidence, assurance in the B-I-B-L-E. And Father, I pray now for the reading of the scripture. Lord, my comments is not going to help anybody, but the word of God will. So Lord, I do ask that you'll take the comments I'll make after I read the scripture. And Lord, speak to the hearts of everyone in this room. Not just our graduates, but everyone from the oldest to the youngest. Now, Lord, speak to me. I know you've already been speaking to me, but I pray you'll continue to speak to me through this message. And Father, may we leave here changed by what we have heard. And Lord, the only way we're, we'll leave changed is if we allow the Word of God to change us. If, Lord, we're uh, stubborn or we've blocked it up, Lord, we'll walk out of here the same way we walked in. And Lord, the message won't help us at all. But Lord, if we come with open, receptive hearts, then I have no doubt, Lord, that you have something for us that we'll walk out of this place saying we heard from the Lord. may not be always what we want to hear, but God is always what we need to hear. And God, we thank you for this day. The Lord, so beautiful outside, and we just thank you for that. And Lord, for all that you do, we'll thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, verse number 20. The Bible says, David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took 
and went with Jesse, and as he commanded him, and came to the trench, as the host was going forth to the fight, and shouted for the battle. For Israel, the Philistine, had put the battle in array, army against army, and David had left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and ran into the army, and came and saluted his brethren. And he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistine, Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and they spake according to the same words. David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, taketh away this reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What now have I done? Is there not a cause? And boy, that question rings out in our minds today. Is there not a cause? He turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former manner. Of course, following this encounter we find in the remaining verses of this chapter that David will fight Goliath. He will overcome Goliath and he'll be victorious over the giant called Goliath. When you come to 1 Samuel chapter 17, you'll find a very familiar story. Even people that are non-church goers oftentimes know the story or at least the analogy of David and Goliath. They know that it was a, a young boy who's way outmatched by this really tall Philistine warrior. And so it's a very familiar story. It's a favorite story among a lot of people. But in this familiar story, there is a forgotten giant. Now, I'm going to save you the time going through this chapter looking for this second giant because you're not going to find this giant number two specified as a, an actual giant. But there is a second giant in 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to show you this morning that David had to overcome. And it's the same giant that you and I are going to have to overcome in our life as well. Lane and Lakin, as you serve God, there's not just one giant you're going to have to fight, but there's going to be another giant that you're going to have to fight. And I realize that David, of course, went and he took those stones. Some Bible commentators believe that he took five smooth stones in his bag because the Bible tells us that Goliath was not alone, but he had several brothers. Many believe that he had four brothers. And so David brought a stone for Goliath, and the other four was one for each of the other four men. Whatever it is, whatever the case is, David brought five smooth stones to the battle that day. And he fought Goliath, killed Goliath, and later on in his life he would fight other giants. But there's another one this morning that I want to look at that a lot of times we just skip right over. So it's a familiar story. There's a forgotten giant. But there's a fundamental truth in this text for every one of us. That just as David served God and fought giants in his life, that when you serve God, you're going to fight giants in your life as well. This warfare that we're engaged in is not a, a casualty-free warfare. It's not a bloodless conflict. But there are casualties, sadly, and there is blood spiritually shed. And when it comes to the spiritual fight, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and demonic uh, uh, capabilities above us uh, that we can't see this morning and you need to realize that the battle is not with each other but the battle is against things that we cannot see it's a spiritual warfare but when you serve God there's going to be some giants that are bigger than you that you cannot fight by yourself there are going to be battles that you walk into that you're not coming out of it good or unscathed or alive if God doesn't help you you've got to realize that when you fight these giants that depend on God and the fundamental truth is, if David could overcome two giants in 1 Samuel 17, then you can overcome the giants in your life today as well. 
I know for a fact that several of you this week have called and some of you have met and we've counseled and we've met together and discussed things going on in your life. And in this congregation, even the size that it is, it's amazing to me how many conversations I've had this week with people that you're sitting here in this place this morning. You're sitting under this roof and you're fighting giants right now. You're facing giants in your life. And you need to know I've come with a word from God to tell you that you do not have to be overcome by the giants that are standing in front of you. You're scared in the shadow of your Goliath, but you don't have to be. God has given you the power. God's given you the victory. God's given you everything you need to overcome the giant in your life. Yes, you don't have to be a casualty. You don't have to be the one he cuts your head off. You don't have to be the one that's a has-been or a statistic or a, a used-to-be. You don't have to be one of those that we look back and say, well, I remember when so-and-so was sitting in the pew this time last year and, and they're no longer here today. You don't have to be one of those people. You can overcome it. There's a fundamental truth. Talk to you this morning about David's victory over two giants. David's victory over two giants. First of all, we see when we read verse 23 through 27 of 1 Samuel 17, the request of David. As we read a moment ago, you know the story. David showed up to battle that day, and he's carrying all these cheese and crackers. And uh, he shows up because his father sent him to deliver this to the camp. And he's going to check on the welfare. His father said, I want you to come and take a pledge of your brothers. You know what that word pledge, it means figure out how they're doing. Go check on your brothers, son. And so he goes there, and of course, just like a daddy would, he said, but don't go alone. Take, take something for them. Take some cheese and crackers, something that's good. They're not going, they're, they're living off those camp rations. And Brother Jim Bob, you know what that's like. I mean, you know, take him something they're going to actually like from back home. So take him some cheese and crackers. And so David shows up to the battlefield this day, and he, as he's there, he finds that there's this giant that is shouting obscenities at the people of God. We find, first of all, there's, as we talk about the request to David, we find the interest for his brethren. He comes not looking for a battle. He's coming to serve his brothers. You know, what's amazing to me is that when he is serving, that's when he starts seeing. He never saw the battle. He never saw an issue until he started serving. You know why a lot of people never see things as they really are in the Christian life? is because they're not serving. You see, when you jump in onto the front lines and you jump into the battle and you start serving God and you get out there, you know what the Bible talks about? He talks about the trenches here in this chapter. When you get into the trenches and you jump into that war yourself, you're going to find out that it's a lot more than what you realize back at home. Back in the wilderness, David didn't see none of this. Back up the road, he didn't hear Goliath. Goliath would be coming for 40 days, and David knew nothing of it. But when David jumped into the service, that's when he saw it. And when you go to serving God this morning, you're going to see that this really is a world that needs Jesus Christ. People will say all the time, well, I don't understand why we need a building like we do on Mount Victory. What's the purpose of that building on top of the mountain? But the problem is they're not the ones serving. If they jump in the battle, they start serving, they're going to find out, whoa, that is a legitimate need. Well, why do we need a, a mountain of 81 acres of land? What's the purpose of that? You know why they can't see that? They're not serving. If you jump out and you start serving God and you start serving this community outside the four walls of this church, you're going to find out there's a lot of hurting, broken people that need a mountain just like Mount Victory and a place like a multi-purpose facility up on top of that mountain. You see, when you start serving, you'll start seeing. And so we find first... The request to David, his interest for his brethren, his inquiry about the battle. He wasn't being nosy. He was just genuinely interested about what was happening. His interest, his inquiry, his inclination, he wanted to do something. He said, what's anybody going to do about it? It's been happening for 40 days, you said. And you know, it's amazing to me that when you read this text, David asked the same question. It had already been answered and then he goes back and he says, what's going to be done to the man that kills this man? It's like, were you not listening, David? But you know, as I read this, here's what I believe. No one looked at David and said, hey, David. Hey, hey, hey there's a man out there and if you kill him, here's what's going to happen. They ignored the boy. Yeah. Yeah. 
that the reason he asked the question is because no one was talking to him. Yeah. David inserted himself and said, hey, I know you're not talking about me. I know you've not included me in the conversation. I realize you've overlooked me, but what's going to happen to the man that kills that uncircumcised Philistine? Yeah. And they said, oh, you know, and they gave him the condensed version. They said, well, here's what's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. And what happened is David showed up to the battlefield today and he requested to do something. He wanted to do something. He was looking to do something. So when we talk about Lane and we talk about Lake and we talk about not just our graduates, but we talk about everyone in this service today. When's the last time you requested to do something for God? When you showed up to the battlefield and said, wow, it's really a lot worse out there than I thought it was. You know, it's just like if you don't watch the news for several weeks or a month or two or three months or six months and you turn it on all of a sudden, you're like, what has happened to our country? You say, what's going on? But when you see it day in and day out, if you're not careful, you get hardened to it. But at the same time, you're seeing what the need is. And the reason why a lot of churches, listen, they got shutters in their church. Don't be fooled. Just like our church. Only theirs isn't actually but not cosmetics. They've got their shutters all right, though. They're not physical, literal shutters on church windows, but they've pulled the shutters closed. And there's a lot of people in churches all around our country this morning that's pulled the blinds, closed the curtains, and they refuse to see what's really happening in the world around us. Can I tell you, the world needs Jesus They need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to set them free and give them hope and power and peace and victory. There's the request of David. There's number two, the ridicule of David. Verse 28, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard and he spake unto the men. Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the knowledge of thine heart, so thou art come down this, that I'm out to see the battle. The ridicule of David. Eliab, David's eldest brother, began to ridicule him. Eliab is the first of the two giants in 1 Samuel 17. He never, David never received a wound from Goliath. The only wound that day would have come from his brother. The only one would have come from someone in the same camp. And that is number one, giant number one. Listen, we can talk all day long about your Goliath, but the problem is more people are fighting an Eliab than they are a Goliath. People that ought to be on the same side, on the same team, doing the same thing, following God in their role, in their place, like Brother Luke preached this morning. But instead, they're fighting Eliab when they ought to be fighting Goliath. And you're going to have to get past some of this because it comes from kinfolk. And listen, I've talked to too many young people, I've counseled too many Christians who said their number one problem with serving God was coming from family. When it comes down to serving God, well, just don't be fanatical. Just don't be all in for God. Oh, you want the will of God? You don't really have to do that. Pick you a good job. You choose it and ask God to bless it, and that's just how it is. But then we come along and we say, no, pray about the will of God for your life. Pray about what God wants you to do. Does God want you to cut hair? Does God want you to run a business? Does God want you to to, to run doses? Does God want you to pastor a church? What does God want you to do? Find out what God wants you to do and do it. But I've had more issues out of parents than I have the children when it comes to those children serving God and saying, hey, we want to go all out. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. I was preaching in Yadkinville, North Carolina several years ago. I'd just come to this church. I was preaching revival meetings for Pastor Billy Seats, who's now with the Lord. And I was preaching in that revival. It's the first time I ever heard the Daughters of Calvary. And, uh, man, God met with us in that service that night. It was a Friday night youth meeting. And uh, there's a young lady who's around 17, just about to turn 18, just a few weeks away from it that come to the altar that night, and she surrendered to go to the mission field. And she's going to go overseas to the mission field. And um, she was all in. She was, it wasn't just a fad. It's something she'd been praying about for some time. She just hadn't told nobody about it. This has been going on months and months and months. And she said, I can't take it no more. I know God wants me to go to the mission field. I don't, I'm scared about what the unknowns are. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just, I'm going to go because I know that's what God wants. I talked to Brother Billy several weeks after that. I said, well, what, what's going on? He said, well... He said her parents 
are the biggest obstacles to her going. So they've done everything in their power to take the out of their daughter's heart and to change her mind. Okay, so you're being a parent and you're being cautious. You just want to make sure your child knows what they're about to get into. They're going overseas, being missionaries. There's a difference in being cautious and killing and clamping down and running that out of their heart. You, you, you have just abandoned your duty as a mother or a father. You have, ju- you have just suspended all of your rights as far as God sees it for what you've done. You just stepped out of line big time. Our children are not ours first. They are the Lord's. Children are a heritage of the Lord. And and it's up to God what he wants to do with my boy one day. I'm not trying to pick it. I'm not trying to choose it. I I just say, God, whatever your will for little Beckham is one day. I'm not saying, God, you have to call him to preach. If you want to, that's whatever. I'll be happy. But I'll be, Lord, I'll be as proud of my little boy if he follows in his daddy and his grandpa's footsteps. And I'll be as happy if he does that. Or I'll be as happy for him if he's doing something else. I just want my boy to be in God's will. You've got to watch out for Elias in your life. You will all have him. I've got him too. Eliab, notice what he did in this text. He attacked. Instead of supporting David, he scrutinized David. You know what he does? Eliab, you can always tell who's an Eliab when they start putting questions out there. He ridiculed. He said, who do you leave those sheep with? Why are you here? He, he attacked the cause of David. He said, you came to spy, which is false. He attacked the cause of David. He attacked the care of David. He said, who has those sheep you've got? And notice how he phrases this. It's a dagger at his brother. It's a jab at his brother. He said, those few sheep in the wilderness. That was Eliab's way of taking his foot and doing that to his brother. There's been a lot of people that have took their big foot and they've done that to someone following God. And Eliab said, you left those few sheep. Hold on. If you go back to verse number 20 of this chapter, notice the Bible tells about how responsible David was because he left those sheep with a keeper. And he left the carriage with a keeper. Were the sheep cared for? All right, then David was good, right? But you know in Eliab, when they start trying to say, what are you doing here? Get out of here. You say, well, this isn't resonating with me. Well, if you're in the battle of the Lord, it's not if, but it's a when that's going to happen. You're going to have faith and alive in your life. He questioned the cause of David, the care of David. No, look with me in, in chapter 16, if you still got your Bible open, in verse number 6. This is such bizarre behavior for Eliab. I don't even understand it. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6, And it came to pass when they were come, Samuel, he looked on Eliab and said, Surely. The Lord's anointed is before me. But, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel, look not on his countenance or on his height of his stature because I've refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, a lot of times people say that it doesn't matter how you, you... present yourself or how you dress your body or anything like that, that's, that's taken out of context. That has nothing to do with, with what you wear or what you don't wear. Yeah. Say, well, you know, man looks on the outside and God looks on the heart, so it doesn't matter what I wear. That's wrong. That's categorically wrong, incorrect. That is taking Scripture out of context big time. What is happening in this, this state is that you've got Eliab who looks the part. He's got the big old smile on his face. He's got the high, he's looking good. He's slicked his hair back. Man, he's sharp. He's, he's dressed to the nines. I mean, he, he just looks really, really good today. And, and, and Samuel, when he sees him, says, that's got to be him. And God said, not so fast. Because his heart's not right. And God refused him. 
a lie of this man. Everybody said, oh, that's the picture, that's, that's the illustration, that's the model. He would have been the one going to Christian conferences. He'd been the one in the youth group. He'd been the one in the choir. He'd been the one everybody would have picked to succeed. He'd been the most likely to succeed at youth camp. But he was not the man that he is portraying on the outside. His heart was far worse than what he is showing everybody else. And what he done is he started questioning David. He questioned, he attacked his cause. He attacked his care. He attacked his character. He said, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. Something about those elder brothers in the word of God, isn't it? What about the prodigal's elder brother? What about David's elder brother? The ridicule of David. You know, what, what bothers me the most is how our churches are overrun. I move to my third point quickly. How our churches are filling up everywhere I go with the liars. When it comes to the work of God, they act the same way a liar did. And you know why a lot of churches never conquer the Goliaths? Because they're fighting with a liar inside of their own building. And that's a word. Number one, we find the request of David. We find the ridicule of David. We find the response of David. Verse number 29 through 30, David said, What now have I done? Is there not a cause? That was my theme verse for rising to the occasion youth rally. And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him after the former manner. Notice what happens here. David didn't take his advice and thank God for it. But David didn't go quiet either. Too many times listen to me too many times christians go silent i'm wrapping up christians go silent when they ought to speak up if your children are being bullied are you gonna let that go on you crummy parent if you are are you going if your spouse is being attacked and you hear are you going to let that go on not if you're a good spouse but yet, why is it that Christians are called, even in the political realm, the silent majority? That's an insult to the church of Almighty God. Why are we silent? But yet, well, we've got to be Christians, so we think that we got to get, you know, quiet. No. David didn't just say, well, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and keep my teeth in my mouth and walk on about it. He said, I'm going to talk to this fella. I'm going to call him out. Alive, you're wrong. What happens is a lot of people get spiritual laryngitis when they ought to be speaking up with megaphones. And what happens in this text is David said, I'm not dealing with it. He said, I'm going to respond to it. His response was direct. It was right to his brother. It was detailed. He left no room for questions where he stood. And it was disciplined. He held back on a lot he could have said, but he didn't say it. What, what I'm talking about this morning is you've got to learn when to talk and what, when not to talk. But when your church is being attacked, guess what you do? Tell them to shut up. When they're attacking your preacher, tell them to what? You go after them. You, you open the door for the devil to really use you or split your home or church. Shut up. You say, I don't understand this. What I'm telling you is American Christianity has become so weak and anemic and passive that we're so limp-wristed and weak that we won't preach against nothing or say nothing about nothing no more. But when the devil's trying to attack, it's time to call it out. As long as I'm the pastor, I'll do it too. If this church settles for mediocrity, I wouldn't have been here. This church is not settling for mediocrity. If you want to, there's the doors. You can go up down the road either way, either direction. You say, you're being mean this morning. I'm not being mean. I'm telling you, the work of God is too big and too important, and there's too many people dying without God and going to hell for us to sit back and not say nothing as the devil robs and rapes the bride of Jesus Christ. You know what a shepherd does? He takes that staff. It's not just to lead those sheep. It's to beat them, too. I'm not letting the devil rob or rape or rake over the coals the bride of Jesus as long as I'm the, the under-shepherd of this church. You've got to learn to get a belly full of some things, ladies and gentlemen. And when you're serving God and you're trying to find the will of God for your life, you've got to have that alive. Tell them to shut up and leave you alone because you're going with God. Yes. 
But what happens is you just sit there and you take it. And what happens is that Eliab thinks, oh, they're taking, they're listening. No. They're going to keep, you're, what you're doing is you've opened the lid to the trash can and your ears have become the trash can in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to be subjected to having you fill my ears full the devil's garbage. Yeah. Yeah. That's the church. Yeah. That's the church this morning. There's a warfare. We're fighting giants today, not just Goliath, but Eliab. And as Sister Monica comes to the piano, one thing that sticks out to me is the Bible says in this text there were three, there were three brothers that went with Saul that day. It was Eliab and two others. Do you know what happened that day? Two brothers were quietly sitting over in the corner of that tent somewhere, or they weren't there at all, I don't know, but they said nothing. And some brothers they were. They'd rather sit on a bunch of lies and stand on truth and say, that's not right, Eliab. You saying that about David, that's not right. Man, that's, that's categorically false, Eliab. You're wrong about that, Eliab. It's been said that we'll long remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. The request of David. He wanted to do something for God. The ridicule for David. You say, I'm preaching at you, and I'm trying to preach and help you because you need to know that there are Eliabs in your life. You need to be aware of it, and when you have that Eliab in your life, you don't need to be surprised by it. You know what you do? Just keep on going. You know how the story ends? With David's resolve. He replied, he said, and the Bible says he walked out, he left the tent. He said what he needed to say, and he walked out. He walked out. He abandoned the conversation. Listen, he abandoned the tent, he advanced toward the goal, and he accomplished the task. You're going to have to walk out of some tents. You're going to have to walk out of some friendships, relationships, if you're going to ever advance toward the goal and accomplish your God-given task. There are some people you don't need to be around. Some things you don't need to be listening to. Sam Ballot, Tobiah Guest trying to pull Nehemiah off the wall. He's just doing what God is letting him do. Opening doors for him to walk through. That's all he's doing. You'll never advance toward the goal, accomplish the task, if you don't learn to abandon some tents. One was a giant that everyone could see. The other was a giant that only David could hear. David defeated Goliath with a sword. But he overcome Eliab with silence. He said what he needed to say, and he walked out on it. And you say, well, there's Eliab. That's pretty discouraging. But the Bible says in verse 31, they heard what David said. And they said, Saul, we heard a young man speak. Eliab was one, but they means it's plural. Just because you fight an Eliab that tries to discourage you from doing what God's called you to do, the will of God in your life, don't feel like you're by yourself or left out. Look around in the church like this this morning. You've got a crowd of friends. David was the only one by himself, uno, that walked down on the battlefield that day. But he said, you know what? I didn't sign up for them anyhow. He said, I'm not impressing my brethren. I'm pleasing God. And God gave him a victory, and that's why we talk about David today, because... He got past the ridicule. He resolved in his heart he was going for God, and he got there. And Lakin and Lane and everybody else in this church, as we, Casey, as you're expecting a child, you're going to raise that child like you did our Delilah, Jacob. It's going to be ridicule, brother. You're trying to witness on the job site, brother Jeremy. Y'all trying to love God, treat others right? You're going to find some Eliabs. But you've got to make up your mind. I'm not paying attention to Eliabs. Forget their ridicule. I'm resolved to go on for Jesus. If nobody else does, if I'm the only true Christian, I'll be that person. I made up my mind at 17 that if I was the only genuine, authentic Christian, not perfect, but if there was only one authentic Christian on God's earth, it'd be me. If someone really believed the book, it'd be me. If someone really loved God, with all my heart I'd try. If someone really knew the will of God and wanted God's will more than anything else in their life, I was going to be that man. And I always lived to it.
but it's still my goal. Your will, Lord, not mine. Let's stand our feet and have your bad eyes are closed. Perhaps the Lord spoke to your heart this morning. And some of you this morning, God have mercy. I felt it when I was preaching. A lot of you fighting the lives in your life. I've counseled with you this week. I know the lives you're facing right now. Oh, God. Some of you, I could see it when I was preaching this morning. You, you register with that. You identify with that. You're, I could see it this morning. You, you're facing and alive in your life right now that you're trying to serve God and get somewhere for God. And Man, you're hurting. You know what you need to do? Resolve in your heart, as hard as it is, that if you're the only one who goes, you'll go it alone. You'll go it alone before you abandon God. You'll go it alone before you turn your back on what God's done and what God's doing and where God's taking you. God has got to be number one priority in our life. Will you make up your mind, I'm going with God all the way. No matter what it costs me, friends, fame, fortune, whatever it is, God is worth more than it all. Worth more than gold. Several on the altar. What about you? You say, preacher, I just want to serve God. I want to be a David in the story. All right. Well, you're going to find a lie in your life, too. And I told you through the word of God how you deal with it. You move on. Not a one of those rocks in David's sling went towards Eliab. You don't win those battles that way. You give it to God, you trust Him, and you walk away. This morning, I'm going to pray, and perhaps you say, Pastor, I know it's not been a salvation message, but, man, you talk about this God who's worth fighting for and dying for and living for and you talk about God that's worth going all in for and following God and forsaking others for. If you're talking about that kind of God, that's not the God I know. Preacher, I, I want a God that I can be so in love with, that I can know so personally, so intimately, that I'd be willing to live my life for Him. But preacher, I, I can't live for God if I don't know Him. I, I, I don't have the purpose, true purpose of my life living for God if I don't know Him. Preacher, don't embarrass me this morning, but would you pray for me? I, I've never been saved. I don't know Jesus. I'm wondering, would you please pray for me? I, man, you talk about big God. You preach about a big God today. I, I don't know him. I just want you to really help me pray. I, I want to. just want you to pray for me. Would there be a hand? Just let me pray for you. I promise I won't come off the platform. I see that hand. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you, my friends. Would there be another? You say, Pastor, you're talking about big God who's worth all this. And his church is worth going forward for. I don't even know who that God is. And that's the problem. Our churches are preaching such a weak and anemic God that he's not worth taking a stand on certain things for. But my God is. You say, I want to know that God. I want the preacher's God to become my God. I want his God to be a personal God to me. I want to know him. Would there be one more? You say, Pastor, I just all I'm asking this morning, all I'm asking is that you pray for me. Would there be another? You say, Pastor, that's me. Would there be one more? You say, Preacher, I, I don't know for sure I'm saved. If I died right now, would there be one more? Slip up hand. I'm, I'm looking. Just want to pray for you. Would there be a child of God? You say, Pastor, and I know this is going to hit some people. I've seen it. All three sections. I was primarily directing my attention this morning to the middle and the back of the church. God had me really focused on some of y'all. Because you're fighting some lives in your life. I'm for you. God bless all these hands. I'm already seeing hands. You say, preacher, I'm fighting alive. Help me, God, to be resolved. God bless hands, are dear Lord, all over. God bless. I see all these hands. God bless. God bless. God bless. Boy, today really registered with some people. Thank you, Lord. Somebody else, you say, preacher, I just... I'm trying to serve God. I'm trying to live for God. I'm just, I want to have my belly full and just walk on for God. Preacher, I want God to help me. Not just, the, I, I don't want to care what they think or say or do. I just want to walk on for God. 
I'm going to be resolved like David. If I have to walk by myself into the valley to fight Goliath, I'll do it. I just want to be resolved. God bless. See all these hands. God bless you. God bless you. God bless. God bless. All these hands. I'd give you 20 God blesses just then if I responded to every single one. God bless you. I see that one. I see that one up front. I see that one in the back. You say, preacher, I, I needed that today. I'm fighting. I'm trying to serve God. And I'm just, I'm tired of the Eliab. I just want to go for God. I want to be a David. I don't want to be the Eliab. It's so easy if you're not careful. You'll be the Eliab. I'll be the Eliab. Don't become the Eliab. Be the David. In a world full of Eliabs, be David. Be David. Be David. Anybody can be Eliab. You can be Eliab any day of the week. Tomorrow, today, to any day of the week. But it takes courage and boldness, determination to be a David. You say, God, help me be a David. Preacher, before you pray, just, just pray for me. I see this one. God bless. Any more before I pray? God bless. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just in a world full of Eliabs, where people are ridiculed for serving Jesus, being all in for God, I want to be a David that is all in. Anybody else before I pray? God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else before I pray? All right. Let us pray together. Father, I wish I didn't have to preach messages like this. But the only way I could get out of preaching a message like this is if there was no Eliabs. I'm sure David would have loved if Eliab would have said, You go, brother. I'm on your side, man. Go for God. I'm glad God's not just letting you serve in the wilderness. I'm glad you go. Go on, brother. Go on. Hey, I'll go with you. It'd been a lot easier. It'd been a, a heartwarming story if we had heard of Eliab saying, Hey, let's yoke up and let's go. I'll be your prayer partner. Let's go together. But it just didn't happen that way. It don't happen that way a lot of times in the service of the Lord even now. God, serving God can be a very lonely place. It can be a hard thing. Please, Lord. As Paul said, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Help us, God, not to grow weary and drop the sword or throw in the towel. Help us, God, to grab our slingshot. Move past our Eliab and advance towards our Goliath. We love you, Lord. Help us be victorious people. And I pray for my friend that raised their hand that they're not sure of their salvation. Please, my Lord, help them. Thank you, Lord, for showing them that and doing that work in their heart. I'm proud of them, Lord. It takes courage. It takes real courage to acknowledge that. And I pray my... Precious Lord, that you'll give them the courage to make that decision for Christ, that trust in you. Bless them, Lord. May they know they can always reach out to me, and I'll be there for them, Lord, to talk, pray, meet, discuss the Bible. Lord, may they know that they don't have to leave here and battle conviction by themselves, but Lord, I'll be here to answer the phone night or day for them. I love them, Lord. Thank God for it. Forgive us, Lord, for all the times we've played the role of Eliab. Forgive us, Lord, may it never happen again. May we be Davids in a world full of Eliabs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening this morning. And uh, I promise you I didn't have Red Bull. I told the church that this morning. And some of you might not believe that, as hyper as I was. But boy, that was... Friday night up on the mountain, early Saturday morning, was um, really in my heart, big time. I mean, I was on the mountain, and probably 20 minutes, God said, go to 1 Samuel 17, here's the, the message for Sunday, here's the points. I said, praise God. I wish I had all my messages this quick. I wish they all come to me like this, sub points, all of it. And I said, even a fourth point, we got a bonus today, bonus points. And uh, God knows what we need, and, and you have we all fight Eliab. And, and the counseling I've done this week, dear God, I know some of you are fighting a real Eliab in your life. Walk on, though. If you walk alone, walk on. Walk on for Jesus. He's worth it. He walked alone for us up Golgotha's hillside.
and we can walk alone for him through some days too. So here's what we're going to do on our way out. Don't forget now tonight, when I talk about general of faith, we, we mean that really don't we, Whittemore? I mean, I feel like it's, it's as big of an honor as if the president was coming, you know, you know, some big dignitary was showing up. It's a big deal when Brother Wayne Whittemore comes. And so please be in your house, and if nothing else, to honor this man. He has lived such a life for God. And uh, yes, he has something to give us, but, you know, sometimes we just, you know, I show up for some of these men just because I want to support them. I just want to let them know, hey, I, I thank you for being faithful to God. And so would you please do that tonight? You know, we'll start at 5 o'clock, and uh, so we'll get started, Brother Wayne Whittemore, and then we'll be dismissed for the evening. And then what we're going to do is Brother Richard's already going back. And he, what a good brother he is. So uh, like Brother Luke said, everything you give this morning in the offering plate that Brother Richard has goes towards the building fund. We've got a table set up outside, Sister Lisa. Uh, some of them slipped out a moment ago. On the third and fifth Sundays, uh, we have suggested donation. They'll tell you what it is. If you don't have it, we're not, we're not forcing it. But what it is, is we've got a ton of Mount Victory shirts and hats. And every dollar, every dime that goes from the suggested donation, some people give a little less, some people give more. Now, what we're asking for the hats and shirts, everything that goes into that goes to what we're calling a George Mueller Scholarship Fund. And that means that when we get youth camp up and running next summer, there's going to be a lot of kids coming from outside of our area. But we want to have a scholarship set up for kids that cannot go or maybe their parents cannot afford youth camp. And so everything you give in this goes to make sure that these kids that could not be at camp typically, they get to go to youth camp on Mount Victory. And so uh, we're, we're full saying hats. So that's what the shirts and hats are for outside. And then we're going to do one more thing. Brother Casey's got the other plate. Now, um, Brother Casey, to keep it from being confusing, because Brother Richard and Brother Casey are sitting across from each other. Brother Richard Trivet, raise your hand, Brother Richard, in case no one, I think everybody knows Brother Richard. And uh, he could be the mayor of Newland. So Brother Richard, he, he's got the offerings for today. Brother Casey, if you'll stand outside, and uh, Brother Travis Curlock, one of our, our best friends, uh, just God's man, just God's using him. He's in full-time evangelism. He's a Marine. He is uh, work making six-digit figures a year for the railroad, left all that, come to a church, then God called him out in full-time evangelism. And if I told you, Brother Heath was telling me last night what his income is a year, I just, I don't know how, it, honest, I do not know how Travis Curlock does it, even possibly, humanly possible, that he does what he does, raising, d traveling the roads, all the miles he travels, and raising, you know, three kids with his wife. And now his wife is going to, she, they found a big mass, and they don't know if it's cancer. And they're really worried, and Travis is canceling his, his meetings. He's canceled the next two weeks of meetings he's preaching. And as an evangelist on the road, the only income he has is when he goes preach at churches. Yes. And I believe it'd be the will of God for our church to give him something. Now, I believe the will of God, if you want to give something extra, but I believe it'd be the will of God for us to give $2,000 to Travis Curlock. Yes. So any, all in favor say Amen. Any opposed? All right. So we're going to give him a check for $2,000 to let Travis Curlock. We need men like Travis Curlock yes. preaching at yes. our churches. We need, I mean, he, he preaches the, the book and the word of God and gospel, and we, we love him. And, that's, and if that was your family, and we'd, we'd help. And we'd, you know, you'd want uh, help as well. And, and uh, we just want to be a blessing to him. So Brother Casey, everything you give to Brother Casey will be above what our church gives. Our church already gives 2000 to Brother Curlock evangelist if anything you give maybe it's on your heart that you put in the plate that brother casey has they'll go on top of that to help brother curlock and his wife and all their medical needs that's it's already racking up so it's already stacking all right isn't god good to us Amen. praise god brother luke you started us off this morning i'm gonna ask that you finish us off today great turnout 150 thank you brother caden man it's amazing how the lord keeps building the church and growing the church it's a good sunday morning it's amazing when you look around you're like how do you get 150 people at church but there, where there's a will, there's a way. Thank you for being here. It's a blessing to see how God's building the church. Brother Luke, if you'll dismiss us, and you'll be at liberty.